This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. You are listening to the Human Action Podcast, and as you know, the purpose of this podcast and this show is to get our listening audience interested in some of the primary sources in reading the great books and thinkers of the Austrian school, where that's Menger, Bamberwerk, or Mises, or Hayek, or Rothbard. And so we're really encouraging people not to sort of take at face value what other people say or how other people interpret Austrian economics, but instead to go out and read this stuff on your own. There's a lot of libertarian and economics content out there, a lot of commentary, a lot of social media, a lot of sites and blogs, and it's very easy to get bogged down spending all your time or maybe wasting all your time uh, reading stuff that isn't really doing you much good in terms of your own personal education. So that's really why we started the Human Action Podcast, to get people reading these books. Uh, and of course, we've been through a lot of the early stuff. We've been through Menger and Bamberwerk. Uh, we've been through uh, Mises up until most of his work other than Human Action. And we will tackle that shortly in a series of podcasts. But we're going to start out before that with Nation, State, and Economy, which was in some ways... Uh, the earlier version of what later became human action. But in the meantime, you know, these these Austrian thinkers didn't just arise out of the ether. They had influences and economists that came before them, obviously people like Adam Smith, uh, people like Jean-Baptiste Say and, and Turgot, and you can go all the way back to the Spanish scholastics. But one of the great French economists who has perhaps not gotten his due is Richard Cantillon, who wrote a really remarkable essay on economic theory all the way back in 1730. And fortunately, we have our own in-house Cantillon expert, Dr. Mark Thornton, to join us this week to discuss everything about Cantillon and to help all of us understand uh, his impact on what would come later in the field of economics. So that said, Mark, thanks for joining us. It's great to see you. It's great to be here, Jeff. And of all all the topics in economics, Cantillon is, is definitely number one with me. Wow. Well... Well, in some of our earlier shows, you know, we have gone through concepts like value and method and interest and money and interventionism and socialism and fascism and liberalism and bureaucracy, all of these various concepts. But what's really remarkable in sort of reading up about Cantillon a little bit this week is that his book, his essay on economic theory written in the 1700s and 1730, it really is a wholesale treatise that attempts to present an entire theory, a broad theory of economics. It's absolutely amazing, Jeff. Um, basically, everything, all the basics of economics is in that book, that one book that he wrote, Method Theory, Population Theory, uh, Economic Geography, Business Cycles, Interest Rate Theory. Uh, it's just incredible. It's it's almost as if uh, this is an ancient alien theorist uh, type of issue where no one can imagine how just one person could come up with all of these concepts um, on his own virtually. Uh, it's really, truly remarkable. When you say on his own, meaning that at that period, economics was not really a standalone science at all. No, it wasn't. Uh, economics was something that philosophers did and bureaucrats did and uh, did it very poorly. Uh, in the book, Cantillon refers to um, a lot of the great minds, uh, John Locke and uh, just all of the great thinkers uh, prior to uh, Cantillon writing this book. And basically, he's very critical of what they did, uh, Petty and uh, Demignon and uh, just the list goes on and on of the, the books that he read and critically evaluated and then came up with the correct solution regarding, you know, how to estimate the money supply and, you know, just the velocity of money and uh, how prices are formed and the difference between positive and normative economics, um, uh, just really, really remarkable. And of course, the Austrians uh, learned from him. Uh, that's almost certainly true with, with Menger, Bambavrik, uh, Mises, Hayek, uh, learned a great deal from uh, this book, really. And uh, it's just chock full of insights the basic method of, of economics, marginalism, subjective value, uh, it's all in there. Well, before we get too much into the book, let's talk about the man himself. Lived from 1680 to 1734. He's got a French name, but he grows up in Ireland. So tell us a little bit about the man. He's got this unbelievable biography. He's actually quite successful in life. 
Oh, yes, very successful. Uh, the family comes from France, Britain, Britain, and uh, has an estate in uh, southwestern Ireland that's taken from them by the Protestants. And uh, Cantillon eventually uh, leaves Ireland to seek his fortune uh, during the War of Spanish Succession. And, uh, and then finally uh, settles in Paris, takes over a bank that was run by his uncle, uh, is involved in the Mississippi bubble, um, and becomes uh, fabulously wealthy, probably one of the most wealthy private citizens in the world at the time, um, and then ultimately uh, meets his death in 1734. Uh, that's also a mystery. We're, we're not sure if he was murdered, who murdered him, or if he faked his death death and uh, in order to escape some of the uh, lawsuits that were filed against him as a result of the Mississippi bubble. So uh, there's still more to learn about this man. But what we do know is, is it's, uh, it's really uh, fabulous. And he starts his career uh, working with uh, the British uh, War Office during the War of Spanish Succession. And uh, he devised a system of double uh, books uh, in which they hid money uh, from the British government. And of course, uh, his employer wanted the money and uh, felt that a, uh, somebody who had lost their property to the, uh, to the British Protestants uh, would probably be a, a loyal uh, employee in, in regards to ripping off the British government. So of course, he dies at the relatively tender age of 54. And again, under suspicious circumstances. Do you think he was... A competent businessman or a corrupt businessman or a little bit of both? I think he was definitely um, a competent businessman. Um, you know, there's there's certain things about that business that uh, lend itself to some dirty dealings. But basically, uh, you can tell in the book itself when he talks about banking and, and what bankers have to be weary of and uh, how, the, how they charge interest. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the, the book starts out probably as a defense of charging interest uh, against the usury laws of the time. And he quite ably shows that a lot of businesses charge extremely high rates of interest. Uh, he mentions a couple of them. One is uh, pubs who get uh, kegs of beer uh, from the brewery, uh, but don't pay them back uh, until the keg is you know, gone. And uh, the effective interest rate, uh, he calculates, is something like 500% annually. Um, and so it's, it's, it shows that he's very knowledgeable about the banking business and about business in general because he dealt with uh, other businesses, basically lending them money and, uh, or lending uh, investors money uh, during the bubble. And uh, it, it, the book shows that he's very well versed in – uh, many different uh, types of businesses, uh, probably as a result of working with them. As a matter of fact, he, he shows in his theory of entrepreneurship, which I'm uh, writing articles about right now, um, that the banker effectively becomes an entrepreneur lending money at risk to other businesses. But he's a successful guy. He's leading this tumultuous life. I mean, why write the book at all? Is he just an intellectual on top of everything else and he feels the itch to write this? I mean, who's his audience and what's his motivation? Well, that's a very good question because he knew that the book could not be published. It was too radical uh, at the really? time. Yes. And uh, there were you know, censorship laws that would have prevented it for sure uh, and probably would have gotten him – uh, in a lot of trouble as it had um, other uh, writers uh, of his time and earlier. Uh, but he, he did know uh, other intellectuals. Uh, it's really in incredible. I can't remember the entire list, but he, he had a good friend named uh, Lord Bolingbroke, uh, who was the first minister of England uh, and would later become an academic writer himself. Uh, he knew uh, Montesquieu and uh, Voltaire and, uh, and, and uh, Isaac Newton is apparently somebody uh, he had met at least. Uh, and he criticized Isaac Newton's work at the British Mint uh, for the way in which the, they handled the, uh, the relationship between gold and silver. And Cantillon wrote that 
you know, Newton did it the wrong way and this is the right way to do it. So he wow. was criticizing Sir Isaac Newton uh, in his role at the, uh, at the London Mint. So the manuscript sort of lays around for almost 100 years or so and Jevons resurrects it or, or breathes some life into it? Well, uh, that's another issue that I've been working on uh, lately, trying to see the transmission path. But he wrote it as a manuscript, and it circulated in handwritten copies. Um, and one would suppose that his clerks at the bank would be, you know, writing out uh, additional copies for his friends and uh, thinkers in general. Uh, one of the copies, uh, literally writing out, yes, additional by copies. hand, yeah. And um, but uh, Mirbeau, uh, the 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 elder, uh, had a copy in his possession for something like twelve to fourteen years, and uh, it's unclear what copy made it into the hands of uh, the physiocrats. Uh, but the physiocrats, the leaders of the physiocrat school, which was very free market school. Um, they're the ones that are generally credited with getting the book published in 1755. And so, you know, they had and, readers. And, and also giving us the term laissez-faire. That's right. The, the physiocrats, uh, Argenstein, I think his, his name, uh, is credited with the, with the phrase uh, laissez-faire uh, that comes out of that. So the physiocrats were, uh, were direct followers of Cantillon's manuscript uh, and th that is reflected in their their emphasis on the land uh, and uh, population, because uh, in Cantillon's book, it's a bit of a misinterpretation of Cantillon. But there's a heavy heavy emphasis on the value of land producing food and food being the basis of your population, and population was considered a, a key characteristic of whether society was. Uh, wealthy and economically, uh, you know, viable, or if it was poor and degraded, and so they they really lynched on to those two uh, point population and land, and uh, they ran with it away from I think uh, Cantillon's original intent, uh, but it shows a very hef heavy uh, uh, reliance on Cantillon's work. Um, and, uh, and then subsequently, of course, uh, Turgot is heavily in influenced uh, by Cantillon. Uh, and Turgot was definitely one of the brightest uh, leading uh, thinkers um, and, uh, and actually a politician. He uh, was a, a regional governor in France before coming uh, first minister, uh, trying to save the French regime. Uh, they didn't accept uh, Cantillon's, uh, excuse me, Turgot's uh, guidance, they threw him out of office once he started making reforms at the uh, kingdom-wide level. He was very successful in his regional uh, role in, in France, uh, but uh, his, those reform measures uh, really irritated uh, the king and his uh, court and the uh, tax farmers who were threatened and the guilds who Turgot threatened. Uh, these are all things that you can find directly in Cantillon's book, but Turgot really was probably his best student uh, and extended his analysis in, in many fundamental ways. Uh, and so in addition to Cantillon, uh, Turgot is a, just a phenomenal uh, uh, contributor uh, and uh, publicizer of great economic ideas. And uh and that influence uh, continues on, of course. Uh, but after that, after the French Revolution, uh, there's Cantillon's work seems to be get lost uh, in the fray. Uh, for example, uh, Jean Baptiste Say is credited with uh, entrepreneurship, the theory of entrepreneurship, but that clearly comes out of Cantillon, uh, even in a much better form. So. Uh, but after, the, after Say, his work seems to get lost in the shuffle and then is only rediscovered uh, by William Stanley Jevons in the uh, 1870s. And, uh, of course, uh, it gets picked up. Uh, Menger had copies of uh, Cantillon's essay in his library. I think he had three copies, actually. And, uh, and so the work gets resurrected by Jevons and others uh, 
And then it, we wait till uh, 1931 when uh, Henry Higgs, the great uh, British economist, translates the essay from French into English into a fine edition. So Higgs is one of the great historians of economic thought and thought it was important enough to translate Cantillon to get the job done into English. And uh, meanwhile, at the exact same time, uh, F.A. Hayek and his wife translated Cantillon's essay into German, and they were both published in 1931. So that's another weird circumstance that uh, seems to constantly pop up around the subject of Richard Cantillon. And then fast forward all the way to 2010, and the Mises Institute, under your editorship and uh, a woman named Chantal Saucier, uh, produce a, another English version of it. But this translation is a little more reader friendly. So, uh, you know, tell us uh, tell us about how that project came to be. Well, I've been working on Cantillon since 1997. I did an essay for our book on the 15 great Austrian economists, and that really opened my eyes. I mean, I'd read uh, Rothbard. On Cantillon, really exciting. Uh, that's a great essay that I actually used as a as an outline of uh, what questions could Murray answer at the time. Those were the things I was going to tackle. So if he had a suspicion about a particular issue, I followed up on it and tried to get to the bottom of things. And um, but there was a lot of things in the essay where it wasn't really quite clear. Uh, Higgs's translation was a direct translation, uh, not really sort of searching for the ultimate meaning of his words. Um, and there were a lot of things that uh, an American audience for sure would not understand. Uh, and there were things that Higgs translated that just didn't make any sense. And so I always wanted to go in and try to tackle it. Um, but of course, I don't read or speak French, a uh, big drawback in that area. So, but I met Chantel, uh, here at the Mises Institute uh, many years ago. She was here for a conference, and uh, we started talking about that, and I learned that she had a PhD in French studies, it was all very interested in economics and uh, philosophy and politics, and uh, so it became possible at that point once she agreed to help me with the translation, and really she did the translating. I was editing to try to uh, uncover uh, the, some of the true meaning and, and the historical context in which Cantillon wrote. And that's very important because all of the misunderstanding about Cantillon's value theory and uh, various things were based on the fact that the historians of economic thought didn't really understand the history in which he was writing. And once you understand the history in which he was writing, then the real story is obvious and simple. And uh, so I was working on that end. She was working on the translation. Uh, and, and it still took us six years to finish because we were, this was like uh, a hobby of ours uh, that we did in addition to our regular jobs. And uh, so we, we took it seriously and uh, we made a commitment and uh, we were able to finish it off. And I, I think it's a product uh, that... Uh, our audience has, has found uh, very helpful because in addition to doing the translation, we provided abstracts for all of the chapters. We uh, provided footnotes for further information about the historical context and footnotes uh, defining terms. Uh, and so the reader is guided through uh, what had previously been a, a real struggle. And, uh, and so we've gotten a lot of compliments from uh, readers um, and, and students. Uh, and so it was, uh, it was very long, very difficult, much more difficult and time consuming than I had ever imagined. Uh, when you've got an English translation already, you wouldn't think that it would be that hard, but it really was. And we're, uh, we're very gratified with all the uh, uh, kind words and, and, uh, that we've received as a result of doing that book. Well, for lay readers, which I guess everyone was in the 1730s, but lay readers like myself, it's called an essay on economic theory. It's actually broken up in some very brief chapters. Yes. It's, it's a relatively short book. And if you go to the Mises Institute bookstore online and uh, put in the code HAPOD for Human Action Podcast, HAPOD, 
get a very nice discount on the book. And it's a paperback, and it's uh, quite quite an interesting read. I found. Yeah, and, and Jeff, even we even translated the title. So the original title was an essay on the nature of commerce in general. So it's an essay on the nature of commerce, which was the word that they would use, in general. So the nature in general, that's what theory is. And so we translated even the, the, uh, theor- the title to an essay on economic theory uh, because that's what translators do. And we have gotten some flack from that, but uh, we uh, considered that for a long time and felt that that was really uh, how it should be translated and read. Well, let's walk through the book itself a little bit. I guess first and foremost, an, an overarching question, is is this book an early refutation of mercantilism that was dominating Europe at the time? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I've written several papers on that subject. Um, Cantillon wrote during the mercantilist period, and there are a few quotes in that c- that can be misconstrued as advocating for mercantilism, uh, but Cantillon is really an anti-mercantilist. Uh, so it's not that he was quasi-mercantilist. Uh, he was actually anti-mercantilist. Uh, and it should have been obvious to uh, previous commentators and historians of thought, the very first paragraph, uh, the very first chapter, which is only a paragraph long, he refutes the idea that money is wealth and restates wealth being the ability to produce goods and to consume goods. Uh, the correct understanding of what wealth is, is the ability to produce and consume. And so right from the very first page, he refutes mercantilism, and he does it several times over. Uh, He also demonstrates that increasing the money supply uh, actually has no positive benefit. Once an economy is fully monetized, increasing the money supply doesn't have any benefit. It always has uh, costs. And so the next round against mercantilism is that uh, he uh, produces the price specie flow mechanism, which says that even if you tried to accumulate specie or gold in your country, if you prevented exporting of gold and if you subsidized the export of goods in order to bring gold in, even if you tried to accumulate it, uh, as a result of the price species flow mechanism, you would be uh, it would be all negated because as you accumulate gold in the country, what happens is the price of your goods uh, goes up uh, as a result of that inflation of the money supply. And uh, so people don't want to buy domestic goods. They want to buy foreign goods. And so as they buy foreign goods, they the gold is exported. Uh, to other countries. And so the price specie flow mechanism basically shows how money is equilibrated around the globe. And so that's another way in which he defeats mercantilism. And uh, finally, he shows uh, that, you know, increasing the money supply can actually lead to a business cycle. And, And it's here where he's credited with the concept of Cantillon effects, or what's sometimes Uh, referred to as first round effects, so that an injection of money into an economy uh, will result in the prices of particular goods uh, increasing and then a production structure is built up in order to produce more of those goods. Uh, But ultimately, if that first injection is just that, a first injection, then that, that change in demand uh, will evaporate, and that production structure that was built in response to that new money will collapse and cause an economic crisis in that industry. So in those four ways, he defeats the primary tenet of mercantilism, which is money is wealth, and therefore accumulate money, you'll be wealthier. Uh, Cantillon showed that that was all nonsense, basically. Well, he's really uh, prescient in making some of his free trade arguments at this point. In other words, um, he is advancing Locke's quantity theory of money so, somewhat, I think, in his yes. arguments. And he's also in, indirectly addressing this, this issue of balance of payments or having a trade deficit with another region or another country. And, he, and he's showing, uh, I, I think he's showing that that's nonsense. Yes. He, uh, he basically uh, you know, looks at trade uh, quite a bit and 
the features of international trade, which are really unseen, basically, uh, by the common uh, observer. And in almost all cases, he supports this idea uh, of free trade, certainly, uh, in the economy, although there are instances where he said that, you know, that this particular line of trade uh, is unprofitable. Uh, for example, this is uh, very interesting. He refers to the example of uh, Belgium lace, and uh, that's ultimately going to be related to the portraits of Cantillon because the Belgium lace is used to paint paintings on, by and large. And he did the calculation. And he showed that, you know, that one bundle of Belgium lace uh, is equal to so many bottles of champagne. And he said that this isn't really worth it. Uh, that, you know, that the uh, that the Belgium lace is way too expensive in terms of French champagne, which you would wouldn't be surprised at. Uh, but one of the reasons why it was such a lousy deal was because uh, trade was prohibited and taxed, and you had to pay all sorts of fees uh, in order to make uh, those kind of international uh, trades, basically. So mercantilism had gummed up the trading network in France and, and elsewhere so that every time you move from city to city, you had to pay uh, fees and taxes. And of course, if you tried to transact uh, on an international basis, you would have tariffs in both directions. And so a consequence of all these fees, taxes, and tariffs, uh, that the the value of, of trade in, in that manner uh, was really, he considered it um, problematic. Well, when you talk about the Cantillon effect, we, we see examples of that throughout the economy today. It, it plays a role in your skyscraper curse book. Yes. Of course, we hear a lot in the political discourse about inequality. You know, you know this is the, the Cantillon effect is, is the untold story of our time. Absolutely. Uh, you can see it everywhere around you. Uh, and the, of course, the Cantillon and Cantillon effects was, was a big part of the skyscraper book. Uh, and uh, really, the first half of the book is about uh, understanding the Cantillon effect, which is that injection of money, leading, changing demand for goods and services, and then the resulting change in the structure of production, um, which is a relatively permanent thing. But if the money disappears, uh, then the demand is wiped out and the structure that you've built is also becomes of very little value at that point. Uh, but yes, uh, you know, the, the skyscrapers that we see going up around the world uh, and the vast building projects uh, that are currently being undertaken is a direct response to the zero interest rate policy that we've endured uh, since the financial crisis in 2008. It, you know, basically, uh, Europe and Japan have been zero to negative rates and the U.S. was near zero for 10 years, and it's only recently um, jacked up the federal funds rate to a little bit over 2%. Uh, and we saw, you know, once we got to 2%, which is one of the lowest rates in my lifetime, uh, the stock market starts to quake and President Trump goes bananas on Twitter uh, because everybody, I think, has an understanding that something just isn't quite natural in the so-called recovery, uh, which I think everybody has doubts about. They, the only thing that they have um, faith in is that uh, we can continue to push the stock market higher and higher and higher, uh, and everybody will be taken care of, and you know the Federal Reserve will come to the rescue uh, no matter what. Uh, but I think that the, the faith in the actual physical structure of the economy uh, is not solid at all. And I think you'll see a run for the exits uh, at some point in the future. So Cantillon gives us a, an early concept of a business cycle theory almost, but of course there aren't central banks at the time. So he's viewing this more in political terms. This is a political cycle. Yes. Uh, he actually has uh, two uh, nascent cycle theories. One is the foundation for the Austrian business cycle theory, which is driven by money, money injections uh, leading to changes in demand, changes in price, changes in the structure of production. Uh, 
which aren't viable in the long run. That's what Menger uh, and the early Austrians picked up on, uh, including Mises, of course, uh, and then Hayek, further developing the Austrian business cycle theory. And then there's more of a, a fiscal-sided uh, uh, cycle uh, where uh, the regime, the political regime, uh, is either good or bad. Uh, and uh, basically, Cantillon uh, felt that uh, once um, the mercantilist uh, policy regime changed in favor of an even stronger mercantilist regime, that the French economy uh, started to go into decline. And so, uh, you know, mercantilism, every country has mercantilist policies, as, as did France, of course. It was all caught up in the idea of raising money, uh, extracting money out of the economy. Uh, and, th th of course, uh, was relatively ably run by Minister Colbert, uh, who was a mercantilist. But then once he died, uh, Louis XIV took over direct control of the, the uh, machinery of government and finance, and uh, he really pressed it. Uh, to the limit, and uh, that's when France, Cantillon said, that's when France went into decline, a multi-decade uh, decline, and uh, and so that was that was sort of a fiscal uh, regime-oriented cycle uh, that Cantillon also noticed. So one thing you point out in your essay about him is that he gives us a form of methodology. I mean, who, who, would, who was even thinking about a method when economics scarcely existed? And so he had this concept that you separate economic phenomena, you isolate them and study them, which, which – th does this hearken forward to a, an individual methodology? Oh, yes. I, th I th very much think so. Um, method was not discussed in a particular chapter in the essay, but it was discussed throughout the essay. And it was – the methodology was implied by what he was actually doing in various chapters. And so he very much understood economic value uh, and uh, he understood opportunity cost. Of course, he didn't have these names. Um, he understood the distinction between positive economics or scientific analytics and normative economics, which is your personal value judgment. He would stop his discussion in a particular chapter and say, you know, this is an issue, but I'm not going to talk about that because that's really not what I'm interested in here. He's interested in the analytics of human action. Uh, and he exposes a lot of things that the common person would not know or understand because they weren't in business. Uh, they weren't familiar with lots of different types of businesses. So he knew all of these different businesses and he looked for the general uh, features of uh, business and commercial actions, basically. And uh, so, yes, he, uh, he very much understood uh, methodology. You know, uh, the revolution that was taking place in physics, uh, I think, is something he looked at and said, you know, we need to we need to have something like that for commerce as well. We need a something like gravity to be able to build a truly scientific understanding of economics. And this is another paper I'm working on right now. Um, and basically, he showed that entrepreneurship was that fundamental thing, the, the idea that we're self-interested in, that we're profit-motivated, we want to stay away from losses, so we incur our cost up front, and then we only get to sell our products later. We know how much they're going to cost, but we don't know how much we're, revenue we're going to get. So entrepreneurship is something, an activity that, you're, that there's a lot of uncertainty about. And so the entrepreneur is going to try to do everything in their power to try to make a profit, but it's it's uncertain. And so uh, he generalized that so that all the entrepreneurs in the economy were basically under that same uh, problem, that same feature of uh, 
trade. And that's what he used to build economic theory from the ground up was the uncertainty due to entrepreneurship. That was a, a guiding force, just like gravity, uh, in the economy. And so if you look at all of his theories, uh, from simple to complex, like the price species flow mechanism, if you take entrepreneurship out of it, it just evaporates. So entrepreneurship is that fundamental building block of the economy. And, uh, and so you, you should understand economics uh, is coming from Cantillon, and, and he basically derived it as a result of his understanding of entrepreneurship as that guiding force like gravity is in the physical world. But again, uh, understand this is, this is 1730 he's writing this. I mean, you can fast forward a couple hundred years, and Keynes still doesn't see uh, the entrepreneur as any kind of animating force. They're still stuck on, on land, labor, capital. It is, I mean, that's remarkable. It's a remarkable achievement. Oh, absolutely. I mean, nobody had done it before. As a matter of fact, another paper is shows that I have that I have shows that the word entrepreneur uh, meant something very different before Cantillon. Before Cantillon, the entrepreneur was um, the active person, the risky person, and ultimately it became linked with government contractors. So somebody who builds fortresses, somebody who builds uh, ports, and somebody who builds, um, you know, big projects for the government, or so somebody who uh, basically is a war contractor, those were considered the entrepreneurs of the time. People who had known revenues, but unknown costs, and who were known to be always skimping uh, on their cost in order to increase their profits. So they were always cheating the government. Bad. Yeah, so it was a bad thing. And Cantillon said, no, 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 we're not doing that. We're changing it so that you know your cost, but you don't know your revenue. And so, you know, the entrepreneur effectively can't cheat on that fundamental equation. Uh, and so, yes, he, he, he ultimately, not only did he change the meaning of the word, which I show by looking at French dictionaries of the time, he changed it to the, almost the very opposite of what the entrepreneur had been known. Uh, and then as you look at those French dictionaries and encyclopedias, um, that his terminology becomes the accepted one. Um, through the writings of the physiocrats and Mirabeau, Turgot, um, Condillac, uh, and others, Jean-Baptiste Sassé, uh, who was only indirectly affected by Cantillon, but affected nonetheless. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's really uh, the fundamental concept of, of economics, but it's a completely different meaning uh, than the original meaning of that term. Do you think he, he glimpsed but maybe didn't fully grasp the idea of subjective value? He talks about property, for example, quite a bit, real estate. And, but So is he hung up on the idea that things have intrinsic value? Well, yeah. He uses the word intrinsic value, and uh, that would be an anathema to a modern economist that something had value in and of itself uh, as a result of the physical characteristics of the good. And of course, we now know that no, the value of a good is based on subjective evaluations of, of people of the good, and uh, and so he was criticized for that, and that, particularly that term. Uh, but intrinsic value is a term that's also changed in meaning, and uh, it's now it's now the sort of the physical, molecular characteristics of a good, uh, but. That is a result of a changing meaning of intrinsic value to more of the physics-oriented understanding of intrinsic value. Prior to that, it was, it was more a subjective concept, like how people valued the beauty of a certain person or a beauty of a flower or whatever. They, they placed value into a product uh, or into a person. And um, if you really look at his um, discussion of value, it's clear that what he's talking about is how much land do you put into the production of something? How, how 
what is the quality of that land? How much labor do you put into the production of a good? And what's the quality of that labor? Is it skilled or unskilled? So you're, you're, what you're looking at is the entrepreneur's decision of how much and what quality of land and labor to put into the production of a good, which is essentially our modern concept of opportunity cost. And so uh, in addition to everything else, uh, Cantillon is credited now with the invention of opportunity cost. He used the word intrinsic value as it as its meaning existed in the 1720s and 30s, um, which would labor, later be redefined um, in the second half of the 18th century to the more physics-oriented word. But it's clear that he's talking about opportunity cost and what the dead giveaway of that is, is he talks about the cost of um, an apprenticeship. So if a father decides to put his son into an apprenticeship, what's the cost of all that? Well, uh, Cantillon, uh, this is very much uh, almost identical to the uh, college economics textbook example of what is the cost of going to college. So Cantillon notes that the cost of going to an, uh, an apprenticeship is uh, the fees that you have to uh, pay to be an apprentice and uh, the cost of clothing for the apprentice. And, and then also the time invested in that. So he says, you know, an apprenticeship is like four years long. So the father doesn't have the labor of the son uh, for four years. And so it's, it's the fees plus the time, which is the example of what's the cost of going to college. Well, it's the tuition and it's the books and it's the time you lose from the job market uh, the only distinction between the two is that Cantillon says, well, it's the cost of clothing. And, of course, that wouldn't work with the college example because you're going to have to pay for clothing whether you go to college or not. Uh, but in Cantillon's case, he's talking about children who on the farm would be working in part to help produce clothing for the family. So that very much is a consideration for a typical uh, French father wondering whether he should put his son into an apprenticeship. But but let's just clarify, even though intrinsic might have meant something a little different back then, and even though he's definitely g giving us this concept that yet at that point unnamed of opportunity cost, we're not crediting him with the marginal revolution a uh, hundred plus years earlier. He, no. He, there's glimpses of it. Yes, there's glimpses of it. Um, so like it, with price formation, he talks about you know, the, there's a market day and the farmers bring their peas to the market for sale and a certain number of chefs show up uh, with some idea of how much they're willing to pay for the peas. And, you know, it all works itself out, but it's it, he doesn't have the full-fledged uh, marginal revolution um, the way it, it would exist uh, 150 years in the future. Now, he... We'll go back a little bit here, but he, he does discuss interest at length, and, and he sees this as sort of a supply and demand of loanable funds. So he's not, an, not a proto-Austrian in that sense. Yes, that's, that's correct. Um, he has an extensive discussion of interest um, in the book, and uh, it's the roles that it plays and, and why it's a positive thing and why – uh, you know, if, again, going back to the example of the pub, if the brewery sells um, a keg of beer to the pub, uh, the price that they're going to collect uh, when they bring the next keg, uh, the interest is embedded in that. So he, sh he, he shows that, for example, that uh, the customers of the pub don't seem to think that this interest charge is really much of a problem. So he puts it into... Uh, the language of the common man as well. So he, he goes into the uh, discussion of interest and its determination and its impact and its role um, at great length. Speaking of proto-Austrianism, I, I want to bring up uh, a paper that Guido Holzman wrote called More on Cantillon as a Proto-Austrian. And in this paper, he discusses Rothbard's treatment of Cantillon, which is very favorable and very laudatory. But he also says maybe Rothbard didn't fully grasp the extent to which uh, Cantillon really was a proto-Austrian. Uh, 
And Holzman starts out by saying, look, you know, the whole book, the, the beginning of the book in particular is rooted in property. It starts off with a, with a property perspective, and that was, is something that other schools don't do. Uh, absolutely. Uh, property is, plays a major role, and that's not surprising because property actually did play a major role in determining who you are and what you did and how wealthy you would be. Uh, so he makes a great uh, deal of importance to the role of property. And uh, as a matter of fact, he starts out by saying that uh, society itself would be impossible without property, that you have to have property rights. Uh, those rights have to be protected and defended. Uh, they have to be tradable. Um, and, and so he very much starts out with this, this concept of property as being uh, absolutely necessary to take any steps further. So in, in that sense, it's just as important as entrepreneurship uh, in, the, in the development of, of economic theory. And he uh, dismisses the idea that property should be equal that everybody should have the same amount of property. He says that that concept is um, ridiculous, uh, unattainable. And even if, even if we did divide up the, all the land equally, he said that within a generation or two, it would all be right back in the hands of a small number of good property developers, basically. Um, so it's a natural, it's a necessary concept. Uh, and it, it's, it, you can see its influence throughout the, the essay uh, because it does play that s such a fundamental role in the economy. Yeah. Isn't that in interesting, though? We're sitting here in the U.S. in 2019. When we think of super wealthy people, we tend to think of entrepreneurs like Bill Gates, whose wealth is tied up in a company and stocks in, in ownership of uh, publicly traded companies, for example. We, we don't think of the richest people in America as owning vast amounts of, of land. But in 1730, and really up until pretty recently across the West, I mean, land was wealth. I mean, it played a much bigger role in people's mindset about who, who had land and who didn't was a lot more important than today. Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, and of course, French society at this time was very unequal and would continue to get more unequal up to the uh, French Revolution. Uh, but it was very much tied to the idea of land, of growing food, uh, of having uh, farmland, of having forests, of having mines. Uh, those were all fundamentally important. And also, Cantillon doesn't mention this in the essay, but it's really very important to, um, to French economic history is that if you were part of the nobility and you did own vast swaths of land, you wouldn't be taxed on it. So if, if you were part of the nobility and this landowning aristocracy, you were also operating in a tax-free zone, which was very uh, handy, basically. Uh, and he even imagines a world in which the entire world was owned by just one person. And he owned essentially all of the land in, in this giant isolated estate. Uh, Cantillon said that that person would be relatively poor uh, because one person, even if they work like mad, uh, couldn't really derive much out of this vast land holdings. And in order to actually generate the benefits of all this land, the landowner or the estate owner would want to hire as many people as they possibly could. And not just unskilled workers, but they'd also want to hire or train skilled workers, masons and carpenters and, you know, higher skilled people, which he's already shown if you want higher skilled people, you're going to have to pay him more money. If you want an apprentice who can make clothing, fine clothing, you're going to have to pay him more money because of the opportunity cost. So he's basically explaining the transition from uh, feudalism to capitalism is this understanding that even during feudalism, the state owners wanted to hire as many people as possible and to have skilled workers as much as possible. And then he says, well, you know, this is all kind of a complex thing for just one person to run. 
So let's imagine the estate owner uh, leasing various farms of the estate to his farm managers. Uh, and in, in a sense, uh, he says, you've created entrepreneurs because these farm managers who are now entrepreneurs, they're going to want to you know, create as much revenue from that farm as possible. And so they're going to switch production from high from low price things to high price things to generate more revenues. And if demand changes in the economy, the entrepreneurs are going to respond to that. So this is where he transitions from feudalism to capitalism by creating new entrepreneurs in the economy who will re- make the responses that the estate owner used to have to manage on their own. So this is very influential on Adam Smith, who in the uh, Theory of Moral Sentiments, uh, published in 1759, four years after the essay was published, uh, he basically uh, says, he paraphrases basically what Cantillon did and said, you know, what if this owner of this humongous estate, you know, owned everything around? And he basically uh, summarized what Cantillon demonstrated. uh, And in many cases, Smith was influenced by Cantillon, but he he knew he wanted to sell a lot of books. And so he simplified a lot of things. And so when he would get to something that required an in-depth discussion of the fine-tuned workings of the economy, he didn't really understand Cantillon well enough uh, to be able to replicate that. He knew his readers wouldn't want to see that. So he would invent phrases like the invisible hand as a way to summarize and to jump ahead, uh, so to speak, with the discussion. So he used that phrase uh, first uh, as an economic phrase in the theory of moral sentiments, and then he used it um, again in The Wealth of Nations, where the invisible hand uh, was self-interest and that individuals following their self-interest would uh, amazingly uh, promote the general interests of society. So he, he couldn't go through that whole discussion because it's very complex uh, and the, your average reader wouldn't want to uh, go through all that. So you just fast forward using the, uh, the phrase uh, invisible hand. But that phrase, the concept behind it, he swiped a little bit from Cantillon and the Physiocrats. Yes, yeah, very much did. I mean, I've got another paper where I showed that he used it three times once in a work before Cantillon, uh, where he dismissed the idea that the gods were controlling thunder and lightning and, and things of that nature. He, so he, it was a negative use of the term invisible hand. And then he used it in the theory of moral sentiments uh, correctly uh, with respect to uh, Cantillon's essay on the isolated estate. And then he used it uh, in the most well-known context in the wealth of nation where self-interest uh, would unintentionally promote the general interests of society. So I, as we're starting to wrap up, I want to get your, your general take. Is it fair to call Cantillon or think of him as a proto-Austrian or is that a stretch? I don't think it's a stretch at all. I, th- I think that, uh, you know, there's... Um, good economics and bad economics. And this is not only good economics, it's the first economics. It's the first attempt to try to uh, generate and demonstrate economic theory. Uh, This is where it's the wellspring of economic science. And uh, I think that Austrians can embrace all that. Uh, Guido obviously did. I have. Murray obviously did. Uh, the early Austrians uh, were most obviously, I think, impacted by Cantillon's work. Um, and it was certainly true of the uh, 18th century uh, French anti-mercantilist school of thought, which predates Cantillon uh, in the work of uh, Sebastian Vauban, um, and, uh, and a few others who were kind of like liberals, libertarians, uh, anti-status, but they didn't really have any good economics. Cantillon provides the economics that is then used by the physiocrats and Turgot uh, throughout the rest of the, uh, the century. 
So we'll, we'll wrap up on this. You wrote a paper about a painting, mm-hmm. a famous painting, that in, in your estimation depicts Cantillon. Uh, it had been argued that there were no known paintings, obviously no photographs of him. So, so talk about the painting and how you got interested in this. Obviously, you're an art guy in general. Uh, you, you enjoy fine art and painting. So this must have been sort of a two-interest dovetailing. Oh, yes. And it was great. I almost – I hate to see it – hated to see it come to an end in some some respect. Uh, because it's like being a in, you know, police inspector or something. Uh, there was no known image of Cantillon uh, and, you know, for forever, basically, that we knew of. Uh, and that has been reported on by me and many others that, that we just didn't have any image of him. And there's a few websites where they have uh, the incorrect images of Cantillon. Uh, but uh, while vacationing in France... 2005, uh, went to the, uh, the Louvre Museum in Paris and uh, walked into a room of uh, early French portraits, uh, which was the foundation, really, of the Louvre's collection. Uh, they were given close to 800 such portraits um, about 100 years ago, or, or more, actually. Um, it was in the uh, late 1700s when a collector donated them to the Louvre. So there's this massive painting on the wall directly in front of me across the room, uh, measuring eight feet across and six feet high. And I looked at it and I said to myself, as I had goosebumps, uh, that that's Cantillon. And I walked over and looked at the artist and it was the same artist that had done Mrs. Cantillon's wedding portrait. And we know that he did her wedding portrait. Um, and this was the most expensive French portrait artist during Cantillon's life in Paris. Uh, so only very wealthy people would go to him. The reason I thought it was him from across the room, because it consisted of a man, uh, a young wife, and a daughter. And that was the composition of Cantillon's family uh, that we knew of. And the painting had been uh, incorrectly thought of as the artist's family. But the artist's family, who we have other portraits of that don't look anything like this one, uh, had multiple children. And so it couldn't possibly be uh, the artist's family. Uh, But I thought it was Cantillon. The only problem is, how do you prove that, right? Right. And uh, so I was looking at uh, just any kind of evidence, circumstantial evidence, that would uh, connect this painting with the Cantillons. And uh, so I went through every possible feature that was in that portrait um, to, uh, first of all, I changed the date. uh, And experts on the subject have concurred that the date was incorrectly. They put it down as 1715. Uh, come to know that uh, it was really in probably around 1730 when it would have been appropriate for Cantillon's family. So that tied them together. Uh, And the reason that we know it was 1730 is because the stockings on Cantillon had only been introduced in the late 1720s in Paris. Um, And uh, and so it couldn't have possibly been any earlier because that those stockings just didn't exist at the time. So he would have been about a 50-year-old man in the portrait. Right. Did, did he look like a 50-year-old man in the portrait? Yes, he did. Um, and uh, I subsequently have found another painting of Cantillon that was done in 1720, the year of the Mississippi bubble, when he became so fabulously wealthy. And it's an individual portrait of him as a younger man. Uh, but if you look at the uh, the family uh portrait and the individual portrait, the men look very much the same except of a different age. And if you look at the Mrs. Cantillon's wedding portrait in the family portrait, they look very similar except of a different age. And uh, if the painting was done around 1730 or 1731, Cantillon's daughter would have been about seven or eight. And if you measure the average height of a seven or eight year old girl, uh, it basically, that's about the height of the girl in the portrait. And the final thing that I uh, 
thought of uh, was that the images on the internet look like they have dark eyes, black eyes or brown eyes. Um, but basically all three of them are genetically are from Southwest Ireland where blue eyes dominate. So I sent an email to the the person at the Louvre who's in charge of 17th and 18th century French portraits. And I said, could you please examine the, the portrait and tell me the eye, color, eye colors because I think all six should be blue. And so she wrote back a couple hours later and said, how did you know? <laughs> and at that point, I, th I th thought that I had figured it out, that it was, it was them. And uh, a final piece of evidence is that they were uh, all Jacobites. Uh, they were all people who wanted to see England return to Catholicism. And that was a secret Irish and Scottish society type of thing, uh, although it was very political as well. I mean, people were actually wanting to mount armies and to invade England uh, over this issue. And so these secret societies existed in Ireland, Scotland, and in France, where all the uh, former Irish Catholics had moved to. And the symbol of, uh, of that movement is the rose. And uh, Largillier, the portrait artist that I've been referring to, had this advertisement that he used where uh, it has 11 hands painted in different positions. And uh, that was important because if you wanted a portrait with your hands in them, that would effectively double the price because hands were really hard uh, to paint. And Largier was an expert at hands. And so he had this advertisement at his studio uh, a portrait of 11 hands, and that's also in the Louvre uh, as well. And the middle hand on this portrait um, is holding a dish, and on the dish is the rose. And that hand uh, gesture is um, also drawn uh, in the portraits of the Cantillons. They, if they're doing a hand gesture, uh, they're using this particular hand gesture. So I speculate that it's this particular hand gesture, which is the, pin, uh, the pistol grip hand gesture. So you're like pointing, pointing your finger out with your thumb up. Um, that would make sense that it was sort of a, like a military symbol uh, that uh, we're going to use force to try to restore Catholicism. And uh, that's how he painted uh, Cantillon and his daughter. Well, Mark Thornton, I think today was more of a history lesson than an economics theory lesson, but nonetheless, this is a fascinating guy, uh, Richard Cantillon. He wrote a fascinating book, and it's well worth your time to check out. Again, if you go to Mises.org, go to our store, look up Cantillon, an essay on economic theory, and put in the code HAPOD for Human Action Podcast, uh, you will get a nice discount on that book. I'm Mark Thornton, thanks so much for your time, and we hope you guys enjoyed the show. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week, and find more content like this on Mises.org. Mises.org.